Looking back, do you think it was a mistake uh, for the United States to have supported the French uh, as far back, uh, starting as far back as 1950? Uh, a mistake supporting the French, 1950. Uh, really not. Uh, I, I think that there were factors in uh, uh, our consideration of helping the French that went far beyond Vietnam and what the French were trying to do there. They'd, don't forget they've been our ally in uh, uh, World War II. We had very uh, close cultural and, and economic ties with France. Uh, we were helping them uh, bring some order and stabilization in a place that they said that they were going to get out of and, and leave there and make independent. Uh, which is what they told us, and I, I think that their eventual intent was to do that. Uh, there was a, a great deal of misgiving in Washington, uh, as far as I could gather, about doing more than, than uh, giving them some supplies and material things and not getting any further involved for ourselves. All right. Yeah, go Lansdale. I mean, nobody knows more about it than he does. I mean, the French part of it, uh, after the end been few, uh, they're savagely beaten by the um, uh, Viet Cong. And that's it. They call it a day. And then they just, they're not paying uh, the soldiers there anymore. There, it really becomes a lack of money by the French uh, uh, estate, the French government, the French empire, which is crumbling, and they don't have any money to pay the soldiers to be in France. It was kind of just black and white, you know, they just, and they just called us up. Now we did have, we'll get back into this. In a I just want to comment on that. Uh, we did have a thing, an obscure program called Operation Vulture. And Operation Vulture, a very secret program, was to use a nuclear bomb to save the French at Dien Bien Phu. Uh, that was not used. And in fact, we didn't do anything to help them, but there was a, a plan on the table to nuke uh, the Kami uh, Viet Cong uh, when they overran the French. Uh, we didn't do anything at that point. Uh, we had our own problems going on where, where we were um, in Korea and also in the Philippines. But uh, what he's talking about is it's not that we supported the French. It was the French. The French left and there was a power vacuum there in, in Vietnam. And then it went to Geneva and they created the parallel in the middle of the country. They literally divided it, 1,600-mile uh, countries divided 800 miles and 800 miles north and south with a DMZ. But the bottom part had no government, it had no state, it had no, there was no country. It, 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 south Vietnam did not exist. Good old map makers. What, the map? Ma you talking about maps? Yeah, map makers. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I, they don't look at it. They just say, oh, you know what? Well, 800, 800. Oh, just yeah, no, that's essentially what they did. I mean, they literally cut it in half. They had an entire operation in the north. Uh, and then, then we'll get into how Lansdale gets involved in a little while. Because there's like four parts to this story. It's uh, not exactly linear. But there is the um, Philippines. And then the two Vietnams. Really, it goes back twice. And then uh, it comes home for Operation Mongoose involving uh, Cuba. Uh, so Lansdale is a legendary figure in American history. He's been obscured, which is why I wanted to do the story. This story is kind of like Wild Bill Donovan uh, uh, meets uh, uh, LeMay meets Smedley Butler. He's got little parts of all three. And you may want to look at those episodes afterwards to see what I'm talking about. But um I wanted to start off with this thing about the tramps because I know that there are JFK assassination people who watch this channel. And if I let it go for two hours, they're going to go berserk because they have the attention span of a gnat. So I figured I'd do this first to uh, appease them. I made the mistake in Dallas of a uh, mistake, quote unquote, <laughs> of waiting uh, until I got to it later in the show in Dallas. And uh, of course, their attention span flipped out. So uh, we'll deal with the tramps now and uh, take a look at these photos. I mean, the, these were originally the last guy was supposed to be Chauncey Holt. 
there was one who's supposed to be E. Howard Hunt. There's one that's supposed to be Frank Sturges. The one in the middle is supposed to be uh, Charles Harrelson. Uh, and, and I don't denounce anyone for doing that back in the day who were citizen journalists and citizen investigators um, because they did the best they could with the information that they had. And this has been debunked for, for a long time, and I'll get into it uh, right now, because those three guys are not who uh, JFK investigators uh, thought they were. There's also the claim that that's uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, if you look at the very far right inside the doorway. Yeah, yeah, it's probably Billy Lovelady with his, with his head turned around. But in reality, there's three guys who are there and they happen to be actual tramps. That's uh, Harold Doyle is the first one, uh, Gus W. Abrams is the second one, and John Gedney is the third one. I think uh, uh, we have some photos of maybe one or two of them. Uh, uh, Gus died, I think, in 1987, but the reality of it is uh, Ray and Mary LaFontaine in 1996 put out a book called Oswald Talked, they were two main investigative journalists, their husband and wife of the Houston Post. Uh, and this is one of the actual hobos uh, that was uh, arrested. And I did find the, the arrest report, Dallas PD arrest report for these guys. Um, all of them have been identified. It took into the late 80s, into the 90s, because they were basically hobos. They had gone to uh, some sort of shelter the night before that cleaned them up and gave them uh, some new clothes, some not. So they looked a little weird um, in terms of their dress. Uh, however, these are not E. Howard Hunt, Frank Sturgis, and Charles Harrelson. I just wanted to make that pretty clear. These are three guys that have been positively identified. Again, let me say this for the 50th time. So uh, maybe it'll go into people's skulls. This is Harold Doyle, Gus Abrams, and John Gedney. Uh, who you're seeing in those photos. And they were in a boxcar. They were taken out. They were booked. The Dallas police claim they lost the um, arrest report. Uh, that's, I think, Gus. that that's uh, Gus Abrams. Yeah. Uh, who passed away in 87. Yeah. I mean, they, they did not go on to incredible careers where you would find these guys. They were mostly alcoholic guys who lived in trailer parks and whatever. But uh, credit to the La Fontaines, who in their 1996 book, Oswald talked, has their photos, their names, and they had done this uh, a couple of years before the Houston Post, before the book came out. I know this sounds insane that the narrative has changed over the years as more investigators have looked at the, the JFK assassination, but uh, people have got to look forward because stuff has changed since 1968 uh, and 69. This is the actual arrest report uh, of the three tramps. We'll put it on locals for those who want to examine it more closely. Uh, I'm sorry that it's not E. Howard Hunt, Frank Sturges, and Charles Harrelson. I can't do anything about that. Uh, I am sorry that it's not Chauncey Holt. I know these people have put out videos, given interviews, done everything they could to make themselves famous. But in reality, not everything can be a conspiracy, as I've told Eric many times, because if everything is a conspiracy, nothing's a conspiracy. So I just wanted to clear that up. Now, the second part of this tramp thing is Fletcher Prouty. Now, Fletcher Prouty, who is a, nu a complete maniac, by the way, he ends up being a Scientologist, a uh, UFOologist. He uh, gets in, in bed with the Liberty Lobby. Lobby. The publishers of, of his book are a Holocaust denial uh, historical society who publishes his book. He is a consultant on JFK, there's no doubt about it, but the main consultants are Garrison uh, himself and, and Jim Mars. Uh, whose books Oliver optioned for the movie. Oliver had many different consultants on the movie, Prouty being one of them. Uh, the, the Colonel X character that Sutherland plays merely gives you a litany, historical litany of CIA uh, political uh, overthrows and stuff like that that are fairly well known at the time. Uh, he's giving a, a history of the CIA, not that he's involved in any of it, but he claims that uh, uh, General Y was Lansdale. Why they didn't call him General Lansdale is I think Oliver had the good sense not to um, open himself up for litigation against Lansdale, who has had passed away. But nevertheless, he does this slight thing on the desk here in the uh, in the Pentagon. Lansdale didn't have a staff. 
He didn't have an office. He was a man by himself. He was a maverick. He didn't have the ability to send people to the to New Zealand. That's not what this guy was about. Uh, they make it seem like he is Curtis LeMay in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. That is not who Lansdale was. He was a brigadier general, but it was really a phony uh, uh, brigadier generalship because he was CIA. And the way he got the brigadier generalship uh, was Alan Dulles talking Curtis LeMay into giving it to him. He was undercover by the United States Air Force. That was his cover, uh, but he was CIA. He was OSS with Donovan before that. But getting back to Fletcher Prouty, he has smeared this guy as being involved in the assassination of JFK. The Kennedys loved him. RFK and him were in love with each other. JFK promised to make him ambassador of, of, of Vietnam. He was so close to the Kennedys that Bobby would bring him over the house on the weekend and invite the green, they had the green berets brought over and they would climb and swing from the trees and onto the roofs of the house at Hickory Hill to amuse J, uh, RFK and his family led there by Lansdale, uh, uh, the, uh, the green berets. And, and, and he was the guy who brought them over there. They loved Lansdale. Uh, Lansdale never had a beef with the Kennedys. It's completely made up by Fletcher Prouty for reasons I, I don't know. Uh, but show the photo that we're going to get into because Fletcher Prouty, again, probably to sell books, says this is Lansdale on the extreme right with his back to the camera. And he claims that he's wearing a ring. Uh, but, but to get back up, Prouty eventually does say, but it could be a thousand other men at the end of the claim that this is Lansdale. Uh, outside the Texas School Book Depository on November 22nd, uh, 1963. Uh, it's not Lansdale. And as Eric points out, he seems to be wearing this big ring, which uh, Prouty says is Lansdale's ring, for Christ's sakes. And, it's not that uh, big. <laughs> I, I don't know about big or small, but he also claims he knows the gait and walking style of and Lansdale. And twisted hand. Uh, the whole thing's a crock of shit. The whole thing's a crock of shit. And, and really, uh, the, the reason this guy did it was probably to sell books. I mean, he ends up being one of the biggest Scientologists in the country, uh, Prouty. So you could take it with a grain of salt as to who this guy is. Uh, but I just wanted to get that out and drive a freaking stake into this thing for once and for all. Because Ed Lansdale is an American hero. He did not and was not involved with the assassination of JFK. And for reasons that uh, uh, I don't understand... When the Pentagon Papers came out, um, this is Prouty here who ends up being in the press. Excuse me, go ahead. I was going to say, Prouty, one thing I was noticing when I'm trying to find photos of him, he loves having his hand on his face. It, it's a weird it's a weird tick, but it's uh, commonly done with people who are very uncomfortable when they're talking. And oh, I just right. noticed over and over hmm. and over, um, it's like always something, e even here posed, the one I showed you earlier, he's got something on his, he, he just keeps touching his face. And I don't know what does, why. That mean? what does that mean? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to say it's, it's a discomfort okay. with um, whatever's going on in uh, body language. Sometimes it could be seen as possibly deceptive, but by itself, you can't say that completely, but it's just an interesting tick. Why is he always have his hand on his face? You don't always see that with people. Sometimes you see it. Yeah, that's funny. But other time, it's just odd. Yeah, he, he, I mean, his claim to fame is he was a pilot that flew stuff over to Vietnam and back and forth. Who talks to the pilot on these cargo planes? I'm going to go up and tell the pilot some secret shit because he's the pilot of a cargo flight. I mean, uh, again, his, he doesn't seem to have the, um, the, cre the credibility uh, for what he's talking about based on his, um, and that being said, I mean, he served in, in battle. He did win a, uh, medals. Sure. And I don't discredit any of his uh, military uh, things. He's, he served his country well and did what he did. What he did. But when it gets to this stuff, um, he's barking up the wrong tree. Let me just put it that way. And I don't know what he brought to the table uh, for Oliver, because Oliver could have gotten this history of the CIA on his own, which he does later in his in his uh, documentary series on uh, you know the U.S. Uh, United States history. Uh, and he's got Jim Mars's book, Crossfire, and he's got Jim Garrison as a consultant and his book. Uh, Fletcher Prouty is uh, uh, kind of a gadfly, I think, in this situation. 
Right. I have the um, a summary of the ARRB um, interview that was done with Fletcher Prouty, too, that we can put up on Locals. If people yeah. want to see a breakdown of all, all the claims, they were, you know, put before Congress, investigated, talked out. Okay. Just put it up there. I, I mean, the show's not about Fletcher Prouty. I mean, this is about Lansdale, and it's not really uh, that much regarding the assassination except for this part, and we're going to get into Operation Mongoose at the end uh, if you want to stick around and uh, and that stuff, uh, which is run by RFK and Lansdale, to be frank. I mean, but uh, to go back to the beginning of the story, Lansdale is, is uh, born in Detroit. Uh, his family, as will be typical of CIA, comes to the United States in 1690, Eric, and settles around Washington, D.C., and goes all the way back uh, to the beginning of the country. I mean, he is the perfect, uh, that must be his grandfather or father. Who is that, his grandfather? Uh, no, it's him. He's on the top, the guy being held up, I believe, right there. Okay. Well, the father, interestingly enough, will... He's raised in L.A. and it's a middle class family. He doesn't he doesn't go to Ivy League schools. He's one of the only uh, CIA people uh, who doesn't go to an Ivy League school. He doesn't really come from money. He's he's kind of normal. He uh, goes to UCLA and be, comes out as an advertising guy and wants to be a writer for The New Yorker. And he will eventually move to New York. But in L.A., uh, he begins to hone his skills as an ad executive. Uh, and there's a little thing I sent you. It's like a newsletter from his ad agency. Maybe you could see, uh, show them um, that little piece. I think it's from their own newsletter. Yeah, this thing here, this is a marketeer. It must be a newsletter. That's him on the upper left-hand corner there uh, reading some copy. He was writing about some products that they represented. He was kind of like uh, John Hamm in Mad Men, if that makes any sense to people. Uh, but he had uh, incredible movie star good looks and uh, a, a real ladies' man. And if you look at the photo of the woman he marries, uh, that's yeah, that's him there. Right. That, I mean, this guy could have been a movie star. Uh, he hooks up with this uh, woman, Helen, uh, who he will marry and she'll be his wife for the rest of his life. Um, but get back to his father. Yeah, there's Helen right there. You could see these two were revered as the uh, power couple uh, at that time in New York and in L.A. They um, were quite beautiful as people and uh, danced and went out and partied. This is later on when he's in Vietnam. This is uh, Helen visiting him with the two kids. But getting back to his father, Harry, his father, Harry, goes back to Detroit because of the auto industry, and he sets up a thing uh, NAPA and it becomes Napa Auto Parts that you mm. people may be aware of today. It becomes a multi billion dollar uh, situation. But unfortunately, Harry finds another woman and has another family in Detroit and doesn't get divorced uh, because the family, oddly enough, is Christian scientists. And I don't know if they have divorces or not, but they don't drink or take aspirin or anything else. Uh, so Harry very rarely comes back to L.A. and he uh, has another wife. I mean, not, not by law, but he has a, literally another wife. This will become a model for Lansdale uh, because Lansdale, despite his love of this beautiful woman and the children and her love for him, which goes on for 50, 60 years until her death, um, uh, he, he goes to the Philippines and put it this way, between the Philippines and Vietnam, He's not home very often. Okay. So he he gets sent to the Philippines. So why does he get sent to the Philippines? He's CIA. He's OSS. He's, let me just back up a second. OSS in terms of he doesn't leave the United States as OSS. His job, because he's an incredible interviewer and listener, is to interview Americans that like we mentioned in the Donovan episode who simply come back from vacation about what they saw. Let me see your photos. What did you see while you were in Switzerland, Geneva, France, Africa? This is who interviewed them. This is the guy that took their photos away from them or voluntarily. Uh, this is the guy who recorded uh, what they felt about the country they were in. This is what his job in OSS. 
Now, what he will begin to do is use the tricks of uh, advertising, the deceptive tricks of advertising in a good way, uh, as a psyops. He will invent psyop warfare for the United States. And he will use these psyop uh, techniques when he goes to the Philippines. Now, why is he sent to the Philippines? He's sent to the Philippines because we can't afford to send the army to the Philippines because of uh, Korea and the lack of more military. Dulles and the Dulles brothers, who are his benefactors, the two Dulles brothers are his benefactors. And it will be Eisenhower who will be his chief benefactor. But the Dulles brothers are the guys that's uh, uh, Alan Dulles on the left. That's twining, I think, uh, in, from the Air Force and then some other cat on the extreme right. And that's Lansdale uh, next to Dulles. Uh, Dulles loved Lansdale, and so did his brother, John Fawcett Dulles, the uh, Secretary of State. And he says, we can't afford uh, to send the military because we're bogged down in a place called Korea, Eric, as you're well aware. So as a cost-saving device, they send Lansdale by himself. And they go, see what you can do over there, bro. <laughs> because... We can't send any more aid. We're really busy here. We've got Chinese people overrunning us with sticks in North Vietnam and we, we get, uh, North uh, Korea. And we've got all kinds of crap going on in the reservoir and blah, blah, blah. So he sends him over there and, and he meets a guy. This is his superpower. This is what Lansdale does. He meets a guy named uh, uh, Mag Sai Sai. And Mag Sai Sai, Ramon Mag Sai Sai is a former rebel who... Be, is befriended by um, Lansdale. If you have a picture of this guy, it's Mag Sai Sai, uh, Ramon Mag Sai Sai will become uh, eventually the head of the Philippines. This is Mag Sai Sai. He uh, was a guy that bonded with uh, Lansdale, and Lansdale taught him and ran his presidential campaign uh, legally. Uh, didn't stuff the ballots. He Lansdale completely believed in the Constitution of the United States. He was completely idealistic. He completely believed in democracy. He was completely an ideologue in the good sense. And because of that, he ruffled a lot of feathers of these nefarious people around him, the Dulleses and, and others, uh, Rostow later with Vietnam and, and other um, um, uh, people in the State Department and in the CIA. But he was his own man and he was used to being his own man. So he didn't have anyone overseeing him. He meets this woman named Pat Kelly, Kelly being the married name. Her husband died. Uh, she was from the Philippines, this gorgeous woman who was a widow. And uh, she becomes his other love of his life for the rest of his life. And we'll get to that also. He's and she was got an a asset too, right? That helped him meet these other Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, she, she helped him navigate the Philippines. And that's how they fell in love. She was working with him as a translator. And she will we'll get into her a little later uh, in the show. But he he hooks up with his Max Sai Sai guy. And uh, he begins to explain to Max Sai Sai that you don't have to stuff the ballots. You don't have to use unbelievable military force. And he comes up with a concept called counterinsurgency. And what is counterinsurgency? People think like, you know, it's like one of these songs by, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chris Christopherson or something that's been around forever. Uh, it's not. It's something that was made up by him. And he is given credit for even coming up with the phrase, which he went through a bunch of phrases. And he came up with counterinsurgency, actually created the phrase itself, besides the op how to operate it. So how does this work? Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of what they did uh, because he becomes a legend at Langley because he came up with these things. They had a chi what's that thing they have in Mexico? The Chara Ruba, you know, they're, they're Chuka, Chuka, Chuka Cabra, Chuka Chuka Cabra, whatever. Okay. So in the Philippines, they have their version of it. I guess we've got Bigfoot or we've got uh, um, the Mothman. We have our own. But in, in the Philippines, they have this thing called the Aswan. And the Aswang is a demon vampire. And uh, the people who were there, uh, the Hucks, were the communist guerrillas that were uh, they were fighting in the Philippines. The Philippines, of course, they were, they were under the boot of the Japanese. The war is now over. You've got another power vacuum. The communists want to take over the Philippines. And they are uh, the Hucks. 
Uh, it's a longer name, but they were abbreviated H-U-K-S. So the Hucks are uh, this guerrilla movement that's in the hills, and he has to deal with this guerrilla movement, uh, um, both of them, Max Isai and, and, and Lansdale. So this is his team, I guess, in the Philippines. No, the Hucks. These are Hucks that were um, arrested. Oh, okay. They're captured. Okay, so he one of the things that they did was, <laughs> this is unbelievable. They took a dead Huck. And um, they pierced the side of his neck with two knife wounds right about here, making it look like two bite wounds. And they hung him up uh, quickly because they what they did was they peeled off the last guard uh, as they were going through the mountains. The last guy of the troop, they picked him off, killed him, put these two knife wounds in his neck hung him up by his feet, drained all the blood out of his body, Eric, and then left him on the ground because eventually, which they didn't have much time to do this, they were going to come back and look for uh, Felipe, you know, and they said, where's Felipe? Well, he, he was back on the trail. So they double back on the trail and they find, they find Felipe with two neck wounds and blood drained out of his body. So they all start yelling, Aswang, 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 and they run, drop their guns, and they start running down the mountainside, the Hucks. Uh, so this was the type of stuff that Lansdale was legendary for. Uh, he will do other things later on, but he convinces uh, Mag Sice. <laughs> he comes up with a campaign. He actually comes up with a campaign slogan from Mag Sci, and it was, Mag Sci, he's my guy. And this sweeps over the Philippines as a simple advertising guy's campaign slogan for a political candidate. And he, uh, this is him sitting there with a bunch of his men uh, in, I think, probably in Manila. It is 1950. Around that time, he was building the campaign and whatnot. 1950 in Manila, yeah. There's one guy there, I think, in the back who's from the, uh, the New Yorker magazine or something. So anyway, so uh, he begins to organize this campaign for Max Eisen. And why is that important? Lansdale believes that the key to counterinsurgency is the father of your country uh, 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 defense. The father of your country is to determine a guy who's the George Washington of fill in the blank. And you, the, the ones that have failed, the counterinsurgencies that have failed, and there's many that have failed in modern day uh, even in the current United States policy, the last 30 years, is not being able to establish a George Washington of the country. This came up. This is something that Lansdale invented. The U.S. has tried to follow it. Uh, we, we brought in, uh, what's his name, a Kalabi, if you remember, in Iraq. Uh, we've tried to do this for many years. We brought in a guy from Turkey a couple of years ago out of Pennsylvania, uh, who, when we tried to overthrow Erdogan, that was a failed coup by us. We have brought in guys who have just been sitting around doing nothing, and all of a sudden they're the leader of this country. Well, but that's this the difference. I think he found somebody who was legitimately tied into the country versus just, oh, let's insert somebody there. No, no, no. They all have ties. I mean, DM was living in Paris when he was brought into uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, the Kalabi guy was Iraq. I mean, they do have they do have ties. Uh, to their country. It's not like you're taking a guy from France and putting him in Switzerland, but they all have ethnic ties. But he took the guy from ground zero and built him up as a presidential candidate and held his hand, which is a little different than dumping Kalabi in from, a, you know, 6,000 feet in the air and saying, you're in charge of Iraq. Uh, they didn't really work with Kalabi. But the point of the matter is, uh, Max Sai Sai and, 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 and Lansdale teamed up to run legit elections in 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 uh, uh, the Philippines and to defeat the communist. And he said the way to defeat the communist is with a better idea. You, you're not going to defeat, and he says this all through his life, you're not going to defeat an insurgent army with heavy U.S. military presence. It's not going to work because you're going to kill civilians, the civilians are going to get embittered, and they're going to join the other side. And he, no matter how many times he tells them this, it didn't stop in Vietnam. And uh, it doesn't stop in other areas, too. I mean, Petraeus will later come in as a, as a counterinsurgency guy, uh, and he will use counterinsurgency techniques, David Petraeus, to his credit. Uh, he he but, studied Lansdale. He wrote yeah, the oh, yeah, uh, yeah. work, I think, for uh, Boot. Yeah, Lansdale will, will later teach counterinsurgencies at the military colleges at the end of his career. Uh, this is where it comes from, this one man. 
So he will be able to go around and show them how to do it. And like he says, you have to have this father of the country guy, and then you got to support him and you got to build him up and you got to uh, make sure that he, without stealing the election. And later on, he'll deal with this in Vietnam. But right now in the Philippines, uh, he's trying to make this guy uh, president of the Philippines. And he wins the election cleanly and begins to set up a government and it works. That makes that makes Lansdale a legend. What he did single handedly with no money to instead of putting Philippines could have been Vietnam is what I'm saying, Eric. We could have done what we did in Vietnam in the Philippines, been bogged down for 25 years. What Lansdale did, he did for 25 cents with one man. And that's why Lansdale's a legend. Another thing that he did, if I recall, in the Philippines is that he said, don't attack tenements, don't you know, be, be very gentle with the people as a government so they'll turn to you to snitch. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. When you use yeah. heavy artillery like we did in Vietnam and killed civilians, uh, they're going to turn on you and they're going to join the other side. He also said that we fight military wars, the other side fights political wars. And he said, our, our very interesting take on this thing. He says, our commander in chief presidents, who are the best political people in their country to become president, you have to be the top devious political dog in the country to become president, give that all up and become military guys because of the other title of commander in chief. And they have no experience. And he, and he demonstrated this by showing that Lyndon Johnson would go over the bombing maps and see where to bomb and decide that he was commander in chief without having any military experience. He's absolutely right. And he said in these other, in the other country in Vietnam and North Vietnam, they would politicize uh, everything and politically get the, the peasants involved in their revolutionary insurgency. And everything they did in their fight was political. In other words, after a battle, the North Vietnamese would sit down with everyone and say, what did you do wrong in this battle? They would literally get together after a battle and go, what did you do wrong, you piece of shit? And they would confess, they'd have these confessionals where they said, well, I didn't back up Ben Fo there and that little thing and that ridge thing. And they would go over this thing over and over again and, and politicize every single aspect. They would have political teachers inside of their platoons to continually remind them about communism and the techniques of Chairman Mao and the guerrilla activities that are in the Little Red Book and how to make sure that they didn't forget the political part of the military operation they were involved in. We, on the other hand, throw the politics out the window and go full military, nonstop bombing the shit out of a country. And, and Lansdale said, you got to do what they're doing. You have to politicize uh, your situation and do counterinsurgency, save yourself a ton of money, save yourself a ton of civilian casualties, and fight fire with fire, basically. Yeah, and uh, he succeeded. This guy gave up. <clears throat> this is a uh, Taruk of the Hooks. Yeah. So anyway, so the Philippines is is cleared by Lansdale, and he uh, is then he comes back and he is sent because of his success. He is sent to a place called Vietnam. And uh, 1955. This is after, like I said, the Geneva Convention. Uh, allows for the splitting up of the of the country uh, into two parts. There is um, a vacuum with a lot of military crazy crap going on, retribution killings. Uh, the French are trying to get out, and Lansdale is sent there. And they said to Lansdale, at least uh, the Dulleses said to him, uh, do in Vietnam what you did in the Philippines. Unfortunately, uh, it's not the same as the Philippines. And that was the problem with Lansdale in Vietnam. Uh, the guerrillas didn't have a country in the Philippines. The other side had a country in the Philippines. This side, they were established in the north and the south didn't have a country. So it was the reverse of the Philippines. And they wanted to do the same exact thing. Um, this is uh, the flag being raised at uh, the Nguyen Bien Phu, uh, the victory of the North Vietnamese over the French. Uh, which, by the way, they don't call it the Vietnam War over there. They call it the, 
American mm-hmm. War. American War. Oh, I was going to say the War of American Aggression. No, no, it's called <laughs> the Ameri- it's called the American War, uh, okay. which is kind of short and sweet. But uh, that's the the, the uh, Viet Cong raising their flag over the over the uh, 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 remnants of that base, uh, which we didn't really help them out with because you know we said it's your it's your problem. Uh, we funded you. We did fund them for a number of years, and then uh, we said we're not going to pay for this thing anymore because uh, we're not getting anything out of it. And I mean, they were there a hundred years, Eric. I mean, the the French raped and pillaged. They made every single person in Vietnam in their government. They didn't have a government. They had a guy named Bo Dai uh, who lived in Paris, who was the emperor uh, run by the French. Uh, All the people who were Vietnamese were clerks and they didn't have any autonomy under the French at all. The French took every single mineral, every single thing worth anything in Vietnam for 100 years uh, back to France. You want to talk about a brutal colonial power? Talk about the French. Uh, because they raped and pillaged uh, Vietnam. And before that, it was the Chinese for a thousand years. But a uh, uh, hundred years of the French was uh, about as much as they could take. By the way, ironically, because of the victory in uh, um, the Philippines, Lansdale got the name Landslide Lansdale. And he made a joke about Landslide Linden saying we both rigged elections, but mine were a little bit more beneficial than, than Linden's. Uh, so he was well aware of the uh, landslide Linden uh, name. He will serve under Truman, under Eisenhower, under Kennedy, under Johnson, and part of Nixon. I mean, think about how long this guy's career was, six, almost six presidents uh, regarding Vietnam. And he will become a legend that's immortalized in two books. One of them, The Ugly American, the other one, The Quiet American. The Quiet American by Graham Greene. And the Ugly American, um, which is really more accurate, two novels. That's the Quiet American. Actually, it came out as a uh, as a book uh, before he even got to Vietnam. To be fair, so any any references there to Lansdale type characters. However, the Ugly American, uh, far more accurate depiction. Uh, William Letterer, Letterer and Eugene uh, Burdick. Uh, Burdick. I think we'll go on to write a book called um, Eugene Burdick will go on to write a book called Failsafe and Failsafe will become the movie uh, starring Henry Fonda and a, um, a friend of mine named Larry Hagman in Failsafe who will play the translator uh, while Fonda is talking to the Russian premier on the phone. And Larry told me uh, uh, one time, he said, you know, people thought uh, it was Hag- one of Hagman's first movies. He, he says, people thought I spoke Russian in that movie. He said, I didn't speak a word of Russian at all. He was faking all this stuff, Hagman, uh, and didn't speak Russian and didn't speak Russian in the movie. He said, people had the perception uh, that I was speaking Russian, but it was not true. So Failsafe is, is, is written by this. Now, The Ugly American becomes a movie that's a lot more accurate than the book uh, and more accurate regarding Lansdale, played by Marlon Brando. Um, and Eric and I were looking at some photos of Brando and Lansdale to see if there was any similarity between the two. You, you at home could be the judge, uh, as to whether Brando intentionally modeled himself after Lansdale, which he obviously did. I mean, in the ugly American, he's Colonel Hilland. I think it's almost Lansdale's spelled backwards. And, you know, it's like this guy who means well, who's a liberal. I mean, by the way, he, he's kind of like, um, He's an anti, anti-communist and uh, um, he's not a liberal, but I mean, he's, he's kind of like a, a, a conservative who is anti-communist, but he would be more like a Rockefeller Republican today, I guess. By Well, he's a free spirit, like he hated ties and that kind of stuff. Kind of right. No, no, but I'm saying politically, politically, because he served, he felt more comfortable, I think, in the Eisenhower administration than he did in the Kennedy administration. Let me just leave it at that. Probably. And he and he felt more comfortable uh, with Nixon and later uh, will actually come back to advise the Reagan people on how to deal with Panama and how to deal with El Salvador. And he felt more comfortable. This is in the 80s. He will come back and deal with that. Uh, and I th- and there was a guy uh, who was a colonel who was prosecuted, who uh, he said was very similar to himself named Oliver North. Uh, this is from Lansdale very late in his life. Uh, uh, but 
uh, again, this is a vice presidential medal, a, a, a medal given by the vice president at the time, Richard Nixon, who goes over to Saigon and he meets uh, uh, Lansdale and um, Lansdale tells him he's trying to run a fair election um, uh, regarding DM, who is his new Mag Sai Sai. Uh, DM is a guy who comes again from out of uh, exile, uh, who's dumped into Saigon. But DM's family, like Mag Sai Sai, goes back generations, and everyone knows DM. Uh, he's a he's kind of an intellectual and uh, not a military guy, uh, uh, but he, again has deep, deep roots in the country, despite what critics have said uh, DM was not a hack. He was not a military guy. He was not a brutal dictator. His brother, however, knew was uh, uh, quite the piece of uh, brutal work. But when Nixon shows up, Nix he says to Nixon, I'm trying to run an honest election here. And Nixon goes, oh, of course, an honest election. And he starts chortling and he starts giving Lansdale an elbow to the ribs. And he just goes, that's just so we know. So we're going to win. And uh, as long as we win, it's an honest election. He's literally winking and elbowing Lansdale when Lansdale tells him this, uh, that he wants to run an honest election with DM. He cracks up laughing, Nixon. He found this to be the funniest thing ever. I don't know what this, uh, this That's is. That's him here. with DM. He's on the back. DM's on the front left. Oh, okay. Yeah, so anyway. So, staying with his line. <laughs> oh, yeah. So DM... Um, again, he's got this brother who ends up being his mil military intelligence, uh, eyes and ears, who's quite brutal. And uh, DM is not. And what 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 Lansdale does is be he befriends DM and he allows DM to talk to him for hours at a time. Now, he doesn't even speak Vietnamese. So this is all through a translator. Um, he allows DM to uh, talk for hours and hours and hours and pontificate on everything. And then the translator would translate. And uh, Lansdale would go, that's a very good idea, and then try to insert some of his own ideas. And the uh, uh, DM would listen to Lansdale. They became very, very close friends. Uh, DM was a righteous dude uh, who didn't deserve what happened to him. Uh, but it doesn't end well for DM. Now, DM uh, will win the September 1966 election. And um, the 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 people back home are pretty happy with what's going on. 56, I'm, right? Um, I'm sorry, take that back. 66 was another election. I'm talking about 55. He sets right. up, Lansdale sets up the, um, what's known as the Saigon military mission. And that's his CIA covert mission, which begins dirty tricks against the uh, Viet Minh uh, in the North and also in Saigon, because they're running around Saigon. So he begins to right away do what he did in the Philippines against the North Vietnamese. And he urges the ambassador, um, who is Henry Cabot Lodge. Henry Cabot Lodge is a Republican appointee uh, who was defeated by Kennedy uh, when he ran for the Senate, the Lodge family and the Cabot family. He's kind of like the John Kerry of the Republican Party. Uh, Lodge is a really brutal, bloodthirsty guy, he will eventually oversee the actual uh, coup of DM getting him killed uh, in violation of JFK's actual direct orders. Here's his, his lodge. Now, no, you, lightning Joe, sorry. I got like, we, we're throwing up people that I'm not even talking about. But anyway. well, I'm so, I, sorry, the sequence. Sorry. I was okay. Off on that. Anyway, so, so Lodge uh, is has a parrot in the embassy and he he teaches the parrot to say fuck Lodge in, in the embassy, which is kind of funny. But uh, yeah, Henry Cabot Lodge will come in a little later. Lightning Joe, who was uh, a World War II hero, uh, was in there. There's Joe uh, Collins. Uh, he was in there before. The, the problem with this is that Lansdale knows more about Vietnam than anybody in the embassy combined. He knows more than the State Department. He knows more than anybody. But Lansdale's a maverick, and nobody trusts uh, Lansdale except... For JFK. And when JFK gets elected and he meets Lansdale, he says, I'm going to make you ambassador to Vietnam. This is not something that Lansdale made up. It was said to him in front of everybody 
uh, when he met uh, uh, Lansdale. He had read Lansdale's reports. Lansdale wrote great reports. He was a great, he was a great writer. Well, that's Lansdale trying to get back in the business. The, the Lansdale was a great writer of reports. They were very colorful. They were very accurate. They were very folksy. He was very comical. He had uh, he would play harmonica for all these people. He was a dude. The guy would explore as part of his getting to know the people of a country. He would explore all their folk music and find the greatest Bob Dylan of the country, whether it's Vietnam or the Philippines, and jam with them. So he would play harmonica, learn their folk music, and this kind of uh, uh, allowed JFK to get to know him a lot better. He was a JFK guy. He was a guy who was open-minded, who had come out of advertising, was the same age, and tried you know a lot of different things that, LB, that uh, JFK was into. Not only did JFK love him, RFK loved him, as I said earlier. So both the Kennedys loved this guy. Unfortunately, um, Rostow and Ball and these other cats did not trust Ed Lansdale because he was such a maverick, he reported to no one. Uh, Lansdale had these drinking parties in Saigon. Uh, they had a house in Saigon that had like a 30-foot boa constrictor and a cage out in front when you showed up. Uh, it was almost like a sub-embassy. It's really where the Vietnamese officials, uh, to the anger of U.S. officials, would meet with the unofficial ambassador of Vietnam, which was Ed Lansdale. Uh, so Lansdale acted and knew everyone. And these other guys, uh, Collins, Lightning Joe, and, and Cabot Lodge, they never left the embassy. They would just drink and go to bed and they'd have these dinners with white shirt and tie dinners and, and they would never do anything. Um, Lansdale got out into the country like he did in the Philippines and he learned everything there was to learn about Vietnam. In fact, he gets a young Turk under his belt who shows up I, I think later on in 65 or 64, this young Turk of a Marine shows up wet behind the ears. And this guy just goes out in the bush and starts shooting Viet Cong. And he's supposed to be in, in, in his group, his intelligence group. And this guy is named Daniel Ellsberg. And Ellsberg is a gung-ho Marine who wants to kill commies. And on his own, he's got some French machine gun and he just goes out on his own Ellsberg and starts shooting uh, communists anywhere he could find them. This is, yeah, that's, that's the machine gun, actually. That's the French machine gun. It's a crazy contraption. Mm -hmm. And he is as, um, as big a hawk as will happen. But but Lansdale loves Ellsberg. He becomes a father figure to Ellsberg. I think Ellsberg's parents were killed in a car crash. And as soon as he learned his mother was dead, the first thing he said was, well, I don't have to take piano lessons anymore. Thank God. So there's something wrong with Ellsberg, uh, which will turn out later. He he gets involved with the wife of a Corsican mafia chief in Saigon. And the Corsican mafia guys come to visit Ellsberg. And they said, we're not going to slit your throat. What we do is we whip your face with barbed wire until it, you bleed to death. So uh, Lansdale has to go meet with the Corsican mafia uh, uh, and tell him this guy was, you know, he was acting out. I'll take care of him. Please don't kill him, you know. So in the so he's protecting this this knucklehead who just got there five minutes ago. Uh, anyway, so during the election, the election is DM versus this guy, Bao Dai, the emperor. And uh, he goes around the countryside, Lansdale, and he says, you're going to get like 90 percent of the vote. Right. He goes, I'm talking to everyone. There's no one who says they're not going to vote to you. But but DM says, no, I want 98 percent of the vote. He's going to do dude, dude. Just take the 90 and shot the F up. He goes, no, I must have 98. And he goes, no, you don't need to steal the election, schmuck. And he tries to rationalize. And he, this is what he does. He he puts, um, he comes up with um, the ballot. He designs the ballot, uh, Lansdale. And the green ballot has a bad picture of the emperor on it. And the other ballot is like a black ballot with a good picture of TM, like smiling. And then the other one is probably the emperor looking surly. Uh, and he gets the 90% of the vote and steals like 8% of it uh, to get 98%. So people, of course, immediately said, as Lansdale told him 900 times, they're going to think the election was rigged, schmuck. 
And but th those people don't want to take a chance. They don't believe what Lansdale was telling them. Lansdale would go out, talk to 1000 people and 990. And I'm just making these numbers up, would say I'm voting for a DM. And that was enough for Lansdale to convince. And he was right. He was right. Uh, but you can't convince these people they're autocratic by nature. And now you also start having these monks setting themselves on fire with gasoline in Saigon. That becomes a problem. Uh, the self-emulation starts and the, the magazines and back in New York uh, start picking up on this. And that doesn't look good. But the real trouble starts uh, because the, the amount of counterinsurgency that Lansdale is doing is uh, not enough. And uh, he goes to Kennedy. Kennedy calls him in and he meets with JFK and says, what do you want to do here? And he says, well, I need some money and I need some advisors. I need some Green Beret. I want to keep up this counterinsurgency force and I need more supplies. And we need, this is where it comes from. We need to win the hearts and minds of the uh, Vietnamese people. That's also Lansdale's uh, creation. His entire idea was you had to win the hearts and minds of these people through education, through maybe social security, uh, through fixing their roads, as the Chinese are now doing in Africa. Uh, this becomes a pervasive concept that, that Lansdale will teach about hearts and minds. So the military industrial complex in, 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 the, in America uh, would rather spend uh, uh, their time making money on military industrial hardware. Uh, the situation with Lansdale is not going to make them any money. Uh, when Johnson comes in years later, they'll put in tons of Bell helicopters and everything else, uh, making Bell a fortune and other military uh, uh, defense companies a fortune. Uh, Lansdale is being outmaneuvered by some really nefarious people. Uh, he stands up to Collins at the embassy and tells him, I don't have to listen to this. Uh, I represent the American people. Uh, he walks out on a four-star general, and he's a, a colonel at that point, right? Yep. And uh, he says, and he's got other benefactors and his other benefactors are the Dulles brothers who go to Eisenhower and Eisenhower calls up Collins and says, listen to this guy, I'm give, I'm backing him. So he does get away with this um, type of uh, insurrection, quote unquote, in front of his support, uh, this insubordination, put it that way, uh, in front of higher uh, ranked military people. And Which, by the way, is is not a lightweight thing. This guy was a war hero himself. No, no, no. He was general, huge. Yeah. Uh, a friend of Eisenhower, who Eisenhower mm -hmm. put in there. And I could tell you in the military, just mouthing off to a colonel, if you're a major or a captain, is tough. Mouthing off to a four-star general, that, that's almost court-martial level. Right. Okay. But he was there with a different agenda than Collins was. Sure. And I think that was the reason he did it because he wanted it settled. And I think that's why he did that. So it would be settled. I don't think he really got off on, on mouthing off on this guy. Uh, I mean, uh, Henry Kissinger. Oh, I didn't say he did. I'm, I'm just saying. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, saying my, I'm saying it for myself. <laughs> I'm saying it for myself. Uh, Henry Kissinger called Lansdale a genius. They also mm -hmm. called him a prima donna on top of that, but he said he was a genius. So, I mean, you get either they love Lansdale or they hate Lansdale. It's one extreme or the other. The Kennedys love Lansdale. And uh, this will come about, you'll see later when we get to it. But right now we're stuck in Vietnam. And, and Lansdale is in the middle of this thing. He comes back to the Kennedys. He goes back again and uh, begins to get some more money. The Kennedys send in 6,000 advisors, uh, Green Beret and other people who report to Lansdale with his his uh, uh, secret operation, Operation Phoenix, which has also been linked to him, has nothing to do with him. It doesn't start till after he leaves Vietnam. That's another albatross that's been hung around his neck. Uh, and there's an amazing amount of disinformation about, about Ed Lansdale that's out there. They attempt to, I think, in a post-Vietnam world, a post-church committee world, they begin to try to lay the blame on, on one particular guy for Vietnam, and they begin to try to lay it on Lansdale. Uh, being this uh, murderer and, and torturer, and none of that was true. <laughs> he never, he didn't even get involved in battles. He wasn't even f fighting anyone, you know, in terms of battles, Eric, uh, let alone throwing people out of helicopters and killing the president. Uh, there, there's a guy who hates his guts. Well, that's, uh, that's I think that's Wes Mullen on the right and McNamara yeah. there in the middle. Nobody hates uh, um, Lansdale more than McNamara. 
And McNamara is all about numbers and Lansdale's all about feeling and gut and instinct and culture and social stuff. And McNamara hates him. In fact, he says to me, comes in, he brings these guns into his office, dirty, rusty guns that they captured from the Vietnam, uh, the Viet Minh. And he dumps them <laughs> right on McNamara's desk, these muddy old guns. And uh, as a stunt, really, and McNamara doesn't even look up and he says to him, uh, don't come back here ever again. In his office, he says, don't come back here ever again. That's the relationship that McNamara had with Ed Lansdale. I think it was threatened by Lansdale. McNamara will eventually go insane. He'll have a complete nervous breakdown. He'll be assigned by LBJ to be the president of the World Bank just to get him out of the secretary of defense role, as you're well aware. Uh, and uh, he'll have his own mental problems. Well, I think he didn't like another, quote, genius either. Remember, McNamara was supposed to be the smartest guy in the room. Mm -hmm. Lansdale was the smartest guy in the room. That's automatically going to be a problem. Right, because McNamara didn't know Vietnam. He'd never even left Washington. He went over there, landed, shook some hands, got back on the plane. I mean, Lansdale was in the bush, knew these people inside and out, and he was a threat to McNamara. Lansdale should have been Secretary of Defense, but at the bottom line, all he wanted which is what JFK, out of the blue, as soon as he walks in the Oval Office, says, I'm going to make you an ambassador of Vietnam. Lansdale believed him. He, he didn't you know, write him a letter saying, I want to be ambassador of Vietnam, but he wanted to be ambassador of Vietnam, and he should have been. I mean, he had the credentials. I, I think they were afraid of having a CIA guy as ambassador directly of such a hotbed like Vietnam. And I think there was some internal feuding uh, going on between state, CIA, and the White House. So um, he he is brought in uh, Vietnam. At, at one point, LBJ shows up as uh, vice president. And uh, that's an interesting meetup with the two of them. His benefactor, by the way, on the Democratic side is uh, Hubert Humphrey, uh, who completely believes in Lansdale. I mean, it's, it's a strange bedfellows that he has. And all this time, he's having this incredible torrid love affair with Pat Kelly. Um, this is Humphrey on the left. That's Key on the right, uh, who will end up running a liquor store in Garden Grove, California. Uh, no, no, not too far from me. Key will be the head of the Air Force and uh, will eventually end up uh, leaving Saigon like many other as boat people. He will end up in Garden Grove, California, right over here running a liquor store. Another guy, uh, the president before him, uh, or after, I forget which one it was, ends up running a deli called Goldberger's in Miami Beach, uh, West Palm Beach. So these guys, these guys, when wow. you, when you, oh, no, 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 no. What Lansdale orchestrates, by the way, is the removal of every Catholic from North Vietnam to South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. 1 1.1 million Catholics, and he uses dirty tricks to do that too saying that uh, 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 the Virgin Mary gets on the radio and says the Virgin Mary is moving south to Saigon. Don't leave without the Virgin Mary. These people pulled up centuries of roots in North Vietnam, Catholics for the most part, and began a trek with some help by U.S. military boats and planes from North Vietnam to South Vietnam. And this left um, a big, sympathetic, anti-communist population in South Vietnam. That's what the trick was. They wanted to get these people out of North Vietnam uh, so they would have a, a clear firepower, uh, a free fire zone, not killing those civilians. But they also wanted sympathetic people in South Vietnam who were Catholic. Uh, Diem was involved in Catholicism. His brother was, Madame Tu. Uh, there was a lot of Catholic uh, uh, stuff down in, in Saigon. French Catholicism, of course, being a big influence going back a century. Um, there was Buddhists, so these Buddhist monks who were involved in uh, uh, the self-immolation. Apparently, the self-immolation was because uh, DM's brother had banned religious banners in parades. I, I had no idea. And the Buddhists were upset, so they set themselves on fire. I mean, uh, you talk about a little extreme. Uh, anyway, so the, the self-immolation was not about the Vietnam War. It was about the corruption and their anti-religious, anti-Buddhist stuff in South Vietnam. But the, the, the big move that Lansdale is credited with was moving over a million Catholics from 
the north down to South Vietnam, which was a big deal at the time um, because they could have been executed and probably would have been executed by uh, the communist common, uh, 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 Viet Minh up there if they'd remained behind. So I think he saved over a million Catholic lives by doing that. And he doesn't really get much historical credit for it, but it's on the record uh, quite a bit that that was one of his big achievements doing that. Yeah. No, it wasn't that part of the fight with uh, Lightning Joe? Was yeah. that they wanted to pull the military support? And he said, no, we've got to support these people getting down yep. here. Yep. 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 They uh, not only that. So he he uh, like I said, he he doesn't really have a Pat Kelly in Vietnam, but he's got Pat Kelly in the Philippines. But now he's in Vietnam. But when he goes home uh, to Ellen, to his to his wife, Helen, uh, he picks up like he's a husband with three kids. Uh, which is not that often, but he's completely intact, nuclear family. Uh, she has no idea about Pat. Pat knows about Helen, and the, he writes these love letters to both of them for decades, uh, to Helen and to Pat, uh, separate. Now, Pat's aware that he's married and has these kids, uh, and she eventually dumps him, uh, and, she, and he is crushed when Pat dumps him, Pat Kelly, uh, she said, I can't be involved in this anymore. I got to move on with my life. He continues to write her letters. He continues to send her gifts. He continues to pine for her. And at the same time, uh, Helen won't give him a divorce. I, something to do with Christian science. I don't know what if there's some caveat in Christian science that doesn't well, There's allow... military benefits and things like that, too, that could have been involved. Oh, that I don't know. That I, I'm just saying. I, yeah, that I don't know. Hunley, always thinking of the money. I like that, Hunley. <laughs> oh, yeah, not just money, but also kids, you know, having a divorce <laughs> their parents. Yeah. Um, the, and in the military society, um, if she was in with other military spouses or whatever, that's like her whole relationship. If there's a divorce, she's out and isolated. Okay, well, that's a story for another day. But <laughs> let me just get into this here, because what, what we're going to see is when Vietnam is happening, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge is sent over in 65, and Henry Cabot Lodge relents, and he tells, uh, finally, he had written all these stuff to LBJ. Uh, we'll, we'll just jump ahead for a second, but we're going to go back to Operation Mongoose. In 65, uh, LBJ finally says, let's send Lansdale over there uh, to support uh, Henry Cabot Lodge. And he gets the benefit of, uh, of LBJ, uh, which he had, had he actually humorously compiled all the folk music of Vietnam and he sent it to LBJ on tapes, thinking that LBJ was gonna listen to the, half kidding. I, I don't know why he did it, but he compiled it. There's Lansdale landing for the second time. That's 1965 in Saigon, he comes back, uh, uh, for a second trip, but let's go back to Operation Mongoose because we're going to get into uh, this other part of Lansdale's controversial career, which is Operation Mongoose. He's brought in by the Kennedys. Now, keep in mind, uh, 61, Kennedy meets with uh, Lansdale and he commends him for his job. Now, you, you wonder, well, like, what's the connection with Cuba? Like, what's going on with Cuba? Well, you got these two guys here, but also the Skakel family. If you remember the Skakels, Eric, there, Ethel Kennedy is a Skakel. I was going to say, yeah, this is the Kennedys. <laughs> That's right. And they own the Skakels, huge sugar operations, business in, right outside of Havana, Eric. And they've got a huge yacht right outside of Havana that's seized by the commies. And the sugar plantation, the sugar business, they made filters for the, um, uh, filters for the sugar uh, processing uh, plants, the Skakels. And they're not happy because the uh, commies have seized the Skakel's um, uh, 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 money and yacht and 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 uh, uh, factory that makes the sugar. So uh, RFK and and uh, uh, JFK come and and they talk to him about what can you come up with to get Castro, and and Lansdale comes up with thirty three. I don't know why thirty three, but he comes up with a with uh, 33 different things to get Castro. It's like an opening list of for his homework over on the plane, right? And some of them are kind of interesting, which I, which I never knew before. Uh, chemical attacks on the Cuban crops, counterfeit currency, para dummies. He wanted, wanted life-size dummies to parachute down out of planes like they were being invaded, uh, Lansdale. 
uh, uh, narcotic traffic accusation. Here's my, my favorite. Uh, announced there was a misfire of a nuclear missile <laughs> towards Cuba. <laughs> Just announced it to the world and then terrify them. I guess that's Ethel Skagel. Yeah. Uh, sp spread rumor. Here's my favorite, though, Eric. This is great. Spread a rumor of a second coming that Christ would return to Cuba and off the coast, a sub would, would launch exploding star shells. It was called elimination, uh, elimination by illumination. The star shells would indicate the return of Jesus Christ to the island of Cuba for reasons that no one knows. And they would overthrow Castro uh, by uh, the, the demands of Jesus Christ returning uh, as a second coming of Christ, this time to Cuba. Uh, but the star shells would explode over Havana Harbor, uh, 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 signaling the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, that was one of the 33. Uh, anyway, he comes up with a lot of stuff for Operation Mongoose. But they tell him to get on the phone. A guy comes in named uh, Bill Harvey. Bill Harvey comes into the office. And uh, Bill Harvey is told to get on the phone with a guy uh, named David Morales, a.k.a. El, El Indio. David Morales is the top assassin in the CIA uh, out of New Mexico, and uh, he's a, a Mexican-American, uh, but he lives in New Mexico. And uh, the plan is to kill Castro, and uh, nobody wants to actually say it out loud, but RFK is running Operation Mongoose. Lansdale interprets the plan as uh, designed to kill Castro. And uh, JFK, kind of on the side, says to uh, uh, Goodwin, uh, uh, Dick Goodwin, his speechwriter, who is the husband of uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, he says to him an interesting quote that's in uh, Dick Goodwin's mem memoir. And, and he says, uh, if we get into that kind of thing, we will all be targets. This is what JFK tells Goodwin on the side, while his brother has already authorized um, the assassination of Castro via Bill Harvey, who gets on the phone to David Morales, who gets on the phone to Johnny Roselli, and Johnny Roselli is based in Miami, and they begin to put together a plan uh, to kill Castro. Now, at the same time, David, Fire, David Ferry in 1961 is fired by Eastern Airlines, and he's working for Carlos Marcello. In, Ferry, in June, Ferry makes a speech at the Military Order of World Wars uh, in New Orleans, and a fiery speech. And he says uh, that anyone could lie in the bushes and shoot the president. He's pulled off the stage by this veteran of foreign wars type organization, and he's ranting and raving about killing Kennedy, uh, as opposed to Castro. And uh, Marcello is, is throwing some money around New Orleans, and uh, Roselli is involved in this getting Castro thing separately. Uh, but you begin to see certain elements are moving in certain directions. Now, after the failed Bay of Pigs uh, situation, when that thing, that debacle melts down, RFK calls in uh, Bill Harvey and says, I want, I want you to uh, uh, stand down. And Harvey, who was a complete alcoholic, Harvey had dug the tunnels under the Berlin Wall and famously wiretapped the uh, East German Communist Party uh, using wiretaps in a tunnel underneath the Berlin Wall. And, and he was a legend from the CIA for doing that. However, alcohol has gotten the best of Bill Harvey. Uh, Bill Harvey is told to stand down. And he is told, he tells RFK, uh, we can't stand down because the invasion is already started. Now, this is a, a second attempt now at a Bay of Pigs. You know what I mean? This is when they were planning uh, and had camps in New Orleans in the woods and were training to uh, uh, have another invasion. And all RFK wants to do in Operation Mongoose is kill Castro. He doesn't want to have an invasion. And uh, Lansdale famously says, initially, Initially, Lansdale tells RFK and JFK the only way to uh, retain Cuba is a full-scale military invasion of the island. Uh, and he's backed up by Curtis LeMay. He's backed up by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's backed up by every rational person. But RFK and JFK says, what about counterinsurgency? And he says, OK, let's do that. And he says, this is how you do it. And they want to kill Castro. So they farm it out with these various groups. This is uh, obviously Bill Harvey's legit. Obviously, uh, Morales is legit. And they farm it out to Johnny Roselli. And that's where the the, the train kind of goes off the rails. And when RFK brings in Harvey to tell him uh, this thing has got to end, 
Harvey says it's already in, in motion, and he sends Lansdale physically to go down to Miami and go down to Louisiana to go down to the swamps, to go down there and find the camps and end the training uh, that was going on against uh, JFK's wishes. And that's where you see in the movie JFK, the FBI raiding the camps that are down there with David Ferry in the swamps with other men who were Cubans. And that was, Lansdale actually went down there and was involved in closing those camps down and ending the training of these anti-Castro Cubans, uh, which may have led to some blowback uh, uh, later. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, he was completely uh, in the confidence of the Kennedy brothers. They completely trusted him. And he had no motivation to be involved in anything. In fact, he was working on on uh, ending some of this stuff. That's As, Harvey. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bill Harvey was a bitter bull and was probably involved in the planning of the Kennedy assassination along with David Atlee Phillips. Uh, he was sent, I think, to Rome. Uh, RFK said, I don't want to ever see him again. Just get him out of here. Um, and he was sent, I think, to Italy, uh, where he ended his career in Italy. Uh, so anyway, at this time, uh, Lansdale came up with some dirty tricks this was the uh, what was known as the freedom worm. Uh, this free is worm, free worm that was involved in. Um, uh, I guess these were memes back then. These were original. Castro called everyone a worm who was an enemy, so he was trying to own the name and created the superhero free worm. Free worm, it's like free bird uh, yeah. with Leonard, Leonard Skinner. So. <laughs> Anyway, so he uh, uh, did a bunch of this stuff, and obviously history tells us what happened. Uh, wasn't completely successful. There was a number of plots against Castro. He will later be called before the church committee uh, when the shit hits the fan. Lansdale will uh, uh, testify before the church committee about these various uh, plots um, on TV. And he will say that uh, RFK was in charge of it. And uh, that was the truth, uh, despite what RFK Jr. says about his father now in some revisionist history, uh, attempting to take his dad out of this thing. But um, the, uh, the, the situation with, with Lansdale, he eventually uh, is brought back to the United States. But in 65, he begins to, like I said, he goes back again and he's working for LBJ. And like he demonstrated, LBJ... With, with all the political uh, brains that LBJ had because of the structure of the presidency of the United States, he became the commander in chief. It's a crazy system, Eric, if you think about it. You're taking people who have no military expertise and he was going over the bombing maps and ordering the bombing himself, LBJ. That's when he went completely insane. I mean, he was choosing targets uh, and when he has no military experience to do this, and he was ordering the generals around, yelling at them, saying, we can't bomb this because of that. We can't bomb that because of this. It's it's crazy. I mean, I understand the legal structure of it, uh, mm -hmm. but there's got to be a better way to do this because they have no skills in doing this. You know, the, the Kennedys delegated, but LBJ literally rolled up his sleeves and said, nobody's bombing anything unless I approve of the target. Uh, based on what skill based on what skill yeah um well that's i hate to say a founding father um blind spot but in a way back when they put this together almost everybody served in some yeah, way that's and right it, and it, and here it, too it, up you know you can yeah. see if it's eisenhower but after that i mean jfk served okay he has a sense of military operation but LBJ then you sort of served Sort of served. I, uh, again, <laughs> he, he flew on a plane. I mean, then and Nixon and Carter, and it goes on and on and on, who didn't serve. I mean, for the love of God, I mean, get out of the way. Uh, anyway, so Kissinger and Nixon get together, and they begin to uh, try to roll down this war uh, by a bunch of different uh, mechanisms. The madman theory, where they said Nixon was out of his mind. Uh, Kissinger... Uh, went around the world trying to deal with the with the Vietnamese who didn't really care because they knew they were winning. So there was nothing for them to give up. So they began to bomb the hell out of them in linebacker two. 
uh, that program and then called it a day and they were overrun. And it's kind of interesting because once um, it became apparent that uh, the North Vietnamese were going to uh, uh, win the war, there was a code and the code on the radio, Eric, I, I, maybe you're aware of this or not, but they came on like radio, like like Robin Williams with uh, Good Morning Vietnam. On the radio, it said very calmly, it's uh, 105 degrees in Saigon and the temperature is rising. And then, they, <laughs> no, 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 this is what came, this was the secret code. This is the secret code, 1975. <clears throat> it's 105 degrees in Saigon and the temperature is rising. And then they immediately switched to White Christmas by Bing Crosby, right? And they started playing Bing Crosby, White Christmas. This is the secret code. It's called Operation uh, Frequent Wind, if I if I remember correctly. And so it's a temperature 105, and then, uh-oh, time to go. And everybody starts booking for the embassy. And famously, at the very end, when they were getting on the helicopters, there was about 400 uh, Saigon Vietnamese left be, left there. They were right there. And the two Marines who were there, they're very orderly up until this point, said, don't worry, there's another two or three helicopters coming. And they went out the side door and they saw them going out the side door. They completely lied to the 400 remaining uh, Saigon people who had served us. And the two Marines called it a day, got on the last plane, last helicopter and got out. And that's when they were hanging on the bottom of the plane uh, helicopters and the chaos ensued. Uh, but I thought that was rather a, a dark day for the Marines uh, to do that at the embassy to lie to those people and then run for it. That was that was kind of sheepish. I have to say that was not our best day. No, could you imagine hearing that over the radio though? The, the pucker factor of, oh shit. Yeah, well, they all had a book, and not to mention the Tet Offensive, because Lansdale's there for the Tet Offensive and uh, all of a sudden, he, they had been out drinking all night, got in at four o'clock in the morning, and somebody calls him up and says, there's some gunfire. And he goes, ah, it's firecrackers for the Tet, of, you know, Tet New Year. And they go, no, 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 bro, bro, you got to get over to the embassy. And they get over to the embassy, and it is just on. I mean, I think we killed, like, over the span of two weeks, 25,000 Vietnamese, North Vietnamese who, who had infiltrated in uh, uh, regular clothing with the weapons in carts and, and sugar stacks and everything else. Uh, this thing was planned for months and months and months, the Tet Offensive, but it was the beginning of the end. Uh, and Walter Cronkite famously said um, that this was the end of the war, you know, and this war will famously end in a stalemate, you know, uh, as Cronkite said. Uh, it wasn't a stalemate. Stalemate seems to be some kind of buzzword for losing, you know, as we're now seeing in Ukraine. Uh, but anyway, Ellsberg, um, for reasons that Lansdale never understood, decides to steal the Pentagon Papers of which him and Lansdale uh, had created and uh, distribute them. He, he had, to his credit, gone to some senators first who told him to go F himself. He went to some congressmen. They didn't do anything. Uh, then he decided to release them publicly. Uh, that goes to court, gets stopped with The New York Times. They give it to The Washington Post. And the Post publishes it, and the rest is history in terms of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, Lansdale is all through the Pentagon Papers, um, as are all these people, as a matter of fact. I mean, uh, Lansdale comes out, in my opinion, as, as the guy who was opposed to the militarization of Vietnam. Uh, there's no other way to spin the Lansdale, I told you so, story, you know, not to do this. And he is constantly uh, uh, not listened to throughout this debacle which becomes one of the biggest military debacles in American history. Uh, he will then, like I said earlier, be called before the church committee and uh, will be asked about assassinations of world leaders. He's asked directly about Castro. He says, I, he says to his credit, he never heard the thing about Castro, and I happen to believe him. I think he was out of the loop on the actual assassination of Castro, but he could be lying. I, I don't know if he's telling the truth or not about that, but... Um, at the age of 76, like I said, he's brought back in uh, by the Reagan administration uh, to talk about Duarte, Duarte's election uh, in El Salvador. Duarte becomes the father of the country of El Salvador. And then mm -hmm. David Petraeus, will, throughout history, since Vietnam, uh, Lansdale's influence of, of counterinsurgency has been used, uh, not as often as we'd like. 
uh, like in Iraq and some other places, uh, Afghanistan, but it was kind of used. Now, in, I think it was um, in his wife finally dies, Helen, and then out of the blue at Helen's funeral, he gets a letter from Pat. And Pat Kelly uh, all of a sudden is interesting in rekindling their romance. Uh, she's 60. I think he's 65. And he gets her a visa and she comes over to the United States. And within a year of the death of Helen, um, he marries uh, Pat Kelly. And it's a little awkward for the kids, I mean, to say the least. But this is the love of his life. He wants to move to Honolulu, but um, he wanted to move to Honolulu with Helen, too. Uh, mm. But uh, Helen did want to give up Alexandria, Virginia, roots, family, kids, rank, the whole sh McGeggy. Uh, and Pat comes over and he finally gets to show Pat Kelly America, which is kind of a moving tribute. He says, you show me your country and now I want to show you mine. And the, their love affair uh, goes on for 50 years. I mean, it's it's an amazing love affair between him and Pat Kelly from uh, 1950. Well, not 50 years, but 1950 uh, into the time of his death. Uh, Pat Kelly will find him dead uh, eventually of uh, heart disease. Uh, in bed and he does have a thing where he falls down before that they put in a stint they put in um, um, some sort of uh, pacemaker uh, but he I, I think it's in 1984 he's like 76 years old so um, he's 65 and she's 58 when they get married him and Pat Kelly uh, but what a romance between the two of them just an amazing romance and th the same thing with with Helen I mean uh, I mean he was loyal to both of them and uh, it's just it was in two different countries. So anyway, so he has to go before the church committee and uh, he kind of comes out. OK, I mean, he's not really uh, uh, tortured by it. He's not really smeared by it that much. Uh, but that being said, he'll end up teaching counterinsurgency at various uh, schools, you know, military schools. And uh, um, history will judge him Um and history has judged him. There's a number of books, like I was telling you, Eric, that I had to read about it. And they're all over the map. I mean, the, the one by Newman, CIA in Vietnam, uh, is uh, disparaging of him. Uh, there's different books, different opinions, but um, this is my take on it. So I, you can take it with a grain of salt, how I see the guy, you know. Yeah, amazing life. And it's kind of cool that he did get his relationship at the end was 73 to like 87 or something like yeah that. yeah i mean he goes up and speaks at berkeley and it's all in the middle of the anti-war movement and he famously says that the, the anti-war movement on the colleges does not start out of the blue the films that they are sent uh to these colleges are from the north vietnamese filming the war and the college students uh, air them this is where the anti-war movement starts he says that they are smart enough politically to infiltrate the United States, which is true. They famously bring Jane Fonda over there. They are thinking politically every single month of the war, and we were not. All we thought was we can crush them militarily. They will surrender. And if you see The Fog of War, uh, the Errol Morris movie, when he meets his McNamara, it's really about McNamara, he meets his opposition in, in North Vietnam, his opposing uh, uh, secretary of defense, and he meets him for the first time. And the guy says to him, to McNamara, he says, you, you never really understood that we were never going to surrender. And McNamara said, why didn't you just surrender? Why did you keep fighting for 20 years? And the guy looks at McNamara and he says, you, you still don't get it. He says, we would have fought you till the end of time. It was our country you invaded. In your home, yeah. <laughs> right, and he, McNamara just looks befuddled. He didn't even get it then. And this is 10 years after the end of the war, or, or, and 15 years after the end of the war. Yeah, well, we don't get it very well anyway. I mean, that that's, <laughs> uh, it goes all this the way is back the, to. This is the smartest guy in the room. Right, but we don't learn. I mean, this goes back to the Civil War, even. They were asking yeah. a, a a southerner they're saying hey you don't have slaves you don't care about any of this stuff you're not really a big believer why are you fighting and the answer because you're here because you're here yeah yeah so i mean it's not a complete surprise okay so you wanted me to put up a picture and oh yeah so people want to people go yeah people are saying where does he get this crap from by the way there was a guy there with lansdale the entire time 
uh, named Lucien uh, Conine, who a lot of people think is the French assassin of JFK. He was a French resistance fighter who had worked with um, Lansdale throughout the Vietnam War. Uh, this is the, the one on the left is all of them are Conine. Oh. Yeah, no, but the one on the left is the one I love the most because it's that's his Saigon outfit, and uh, he was a a anti Nazi French resistance fighter, French, uh, who was uh, born in the United States and um, would later join the CIA and become very active with um, Lansdale in Vietnam. All right, and we want to look at the collection of books that were involved for this. And I will put links in the description later. I didn't get a chance to do it yet. There are affiliation links. So if you yeah, want this to is where them, your book fund money, money goes, people. I mean, uh, that's the book Oswald Talks, uh, JFK in Vietnam by John Newman. There's the Proudy book in there. There's a biography by Lansdale called, uh, uh, autobiography called In the Midst, uh, that's Best and the Brightest by David Havelstan. Palestine, and then uh, Krakauer's Vietnam, which is the master work on Vietnam, if anybody's interested. Uh, Sons and Brothers is about the uh, uh, the JFK brothers and Lansdale's and the, uh, the uh, Kennedy brothers. And Lansdale's in there. People have asked, you know, where are you getting this shit from, Grover? <laughs> so I thought we'd put this stuff up so people could see I'm not making this up. All right. And everybody's uh, complaining about Max Boot, which... His book is pretty informative about Lansdale. I don't know. I don't really know the guy, so I can tell you it's a great book. All right. Um, got some super chats that came in, people who want to support us here. George Erickson said, Mark, do you have a photographic memory? Your information is so on point and thorough. Just asking, Mark, do you have a photographic memory? I guess they forgot the first time. Your information is so on point and thorough. Just asking. You know, I met that girl who's got a, a photographic memory, the one from Taxi, the actress um, with the, she has huge things in front of her. Um, very nice, very funny comic actress. I forget her name. She was in Taxi with uh, uh, Andy Kaufman. And uh, I said, do you remember every single thing? She has that, that thing. You remember every single event in your life? She says, yeah. I said, so you're going to remember this, meeting me, talking to me right now. And she said, Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Which is very funny. Yeah, it is. Um, TB, I was a sailor, a sailor, and we often visited Subic Bay, Philippines. The main drag outside the base was called Maxisig Drive, and I never knew the origins of that name until now. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, my father was there, too, in World War II. He ended up in the Philippines, and... Um, uh, there's a lot of Philippine people who love the United States to this day, and, and, and a lot of them here in L.A., um, and a lot of them in healthcare, and they were given um, uh, special visas to come over to be nurses uh, because of the shortage of nurses here in California years ago, and a lot of them work in healthcare now. And he also used a lot of Filipino uh, medical professionals in Vietnam. To. Yeah, that was a CIA program called Operation Something or Other, where they vaccinated everyone for polio and some, everything else for free. He brought over Filipino uh, medical people. Um, Rustus Android, what does this have to do with Dorothy Kilgallen? Kilgallen was his third wife. It's in one of the autobiographies. It's, I'm not going to get into the relationship, but Kilgallen and him were a couple. All right. Uh, I'm going to skip one and come back to it. Did Ed Lansdale kill Dorothy Kilgallen? <laughs> he might have been. He was killing Castro, and then he looked on the list, and it said kill, kill Gallon. Gallon. Kill oh, Gallon. that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> kill Gallon. Uh, John Paul Van? Yeah, apparently a friend of uh, Lansdale's, a book, a Bright Shining Lie, if you want to read that about John Paul Van. Um, I understand that's another great subject. All right. Um, Jay's Nuts. Great stream. Learned a lot. Thanks. Thank you. And coming in hot, Shane Culkin. Mark, will Cliff Carter be getting his own episode? And thank you, Eric, for reading this. Uh, he will. All right. Uh, Kim Opperman. Love you guys. Got my time double issue today. Oh, very good. Good idea. And Pasha. Mark, I wish I would have known this story before. Thanks for telling it. But how many more of these known slash unknown stories do you think there are? 
Well, we have quite a list. I mean, so uh, this is kind of what we do here. Uh, these known unknown stories where people think they know the story and then they go, Oh, I never knew any of that. <laughs> it's just like how many people said, I thought I knew everything about Willie Nelson. Oh shit. I didn't know anything about Willie Nelson. We've done this with, with so many different figures at this point that people kind of trust us now. Believe me, if we're putting it up as a story, believe me, you don't know the story. I'll, and I'll to be fair, it. Mark discovers while he's going. Yeah, too. I mean, I do this because I'm interested in the goddamn thing, you know. And then he'll sit there research, and he's we're on the phone. He's like, "Did you know this? Did you know this?" You know and, I, I, uh, no, I didn't know about the Skakel family's interest in in Cuba. I mean, I that was one of my great takeaways was the Skakels, you know, because now Skakel himself, who uh, RFK Jr. went to bat for for killing the babysitter girlfriend, is now suing the police. Uh, for arresting him for the murder of killing the girl, which he may or may not have killed. So apparently his brother, the other Skakel, killed the girl, and he took the rap. But that's a story for another day we'll probably get into. All right. Um, Trey, I'm not going to read the super chat out loud, but Mark can see what you're saying. And we do appreciate the super chat. And if it's being suppressed, my reading out loud is not going to be helpful. Okay. Because well, stand, uh, stand with Israel. YouTube uh, does track my words, and that's where things get wonky on the show for monetization, just to let people know. So sometimes I won't read out loud. We'll just put something up on the screen. It's a free country. I mean, everybody knows we're totally free. We have free speech, greatest country on earth. Um, everybody mm -hmm. knows that. With the greatest service, which is... Greatest service. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Total, total freedom here. Um, and joy and liberation, <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> But what does give us joy is consider uh, following us on Locals because we are going to be heading there next. And again, you can always follow us for free. You can be a Locals member. You don't have to pay to be a member. If you want to pay for $70 a year, we put a lot of extra material in there, including the Oswald scripted um, audio drama working on getting part two up at the end yeah, of the Some month. guy was asking about that the other day. Like he said, I paid $70 and I got no acknowledgement. Are you um, supposed to get, yeah. you're supposed to get an acknowledgement or something. What are you supposed to get? Um, well, from we're supposed to, to say his you, name. We're supposed thank to say you his name. very much for joining locals. <laughs> yeah, Those of you who have joined. Yeah. And um, I do try to respond as, as much as I can. And mm -hmm. I know Mark does as well. And we do appreciate it. But we appreciate all of you, even those who are watching for free, all those who just uh, give us a subscription. We oh, do yeah. appreciate it. Uh, you know, it wouldn't hurt to subscribe. We've been stuck on 106 for about 106 months. <laughs> they, they, it wouldn't kill you to subscribe or even like the thing. I see on other channels as soon as the show starts, even mm -hmm. even what's his name? The British comic, uh, Russell Russell oh, Brand? he does it instantly. Yeah. Instantly. I mean, there must be something to that. I mean, why is Russell sure. Brand bothering to do that? Maybe we should copy Russell Brand and do it at the beginning. I mean, maybe, I, I, maybe, I don't know. That. Maybe pe you know, people must either do it at the beginning or they never do it. You know, I mean, maybe that's a thing. No, I, I, I know that people do it and why they do it. I personally feel like it's kind of cool if I give content before I ask you to like it. I know, I know, but I'm saying this is not a perfect world, apparently. Look, we're getting no. screwed by YouTube every day. This is true. But you right? know what? We're I'm... not getting screwed by locals. And that's no, why I, I encourage folks to definitely follow us there. And also, you can always uh, support Mark um, and myself. With hey, PayPal, these, books don't, <laughs> these books don't buy themselves, folks. Look at that stack for one subject. Uh, for sure. We uh, we have merch links in the description. Oh, yeah. yeah, you could buy that. I mean, that's we could fun. get. You can always get Oswald if you like that. We have the JFK Wait a minute. cards. What about the meetup, Eric? Uh, the meetup, I scoped out Youngstown. I'm trying to nut down the details to figure out the pricing, etc. Right. Uh, when when tickets, do tickets go on sale? Hopefully Friday. Hopefully Friday. Oh, wow. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, if not over the weekend. I, I just don't want to say... Okay, we're gonna go one price, and we, we've got to get everything coming in to make sure. Okay, yes, we can do it for this price. Well, this it's coming up pretty soon. I mean, the, the yeah, nine March, weeks. Trust oh, me, nine weeks. I mean, that's the Ohio prime, the Ohio primary. I agree. I mean, and I, I have to register in Ohio. I have to get in there and register early, <laughs> and uh, and make sure I can vote in the Ohio. I did this in, in Palm Beach on time for when I was working for a website. I registered at my parents' house to vote. 
and they had the remember the whole butterfly ballot snafu and it was um, the chads the hanging chads. no that was the that was the oh, chads yeah. this was the butterfly ballot uh, snafu uh which was a whole completely different snafu uh which i did for crooks and liars a uh, a website back in the day but anyway that being said um we will be in um the great state of ohio uh for march yep. 15th that weekend with the um with the St. Patrick's Day weekend and all the crazy crap that's going to go on in Youngstown. So we strongly urge you to get your tickets early because they're limited. And again, um, I, I'm going to put it up first for people who are supporters on Locals mm -hmm. and, and with a discount, which um, you know helps cover the investment that people are putting in for the year. You get a discount mm -hmm. after you've invested in us and we invest in you. So I, again, encourage... You might want to follow us on Locals, and we're going to be heading there. Wait right a second. Now. I just want to ask you one more question before we go over there. Sure. Um, I just want to tell people that on Friday, the first half hour of the show, we have Jason Rance on, who's been on Tucker Carlson. Uh, just as I don't want to leave these people hanging because he, he's not going to be on later because he's got his own radio show to do here in Seattle on the West, here in Seattle. I'm not in Seattle, but the West Coast um, and Pacific Central time. So he's going to be on from 5 30 to 6 eastern time on freeform friday uh um so i just want people to know that we're having him on there and he's got a new book out which we'll get into uh when he comes on the show definitely it's a really good book great stuff and but everybody else will follow us to locals and they'll find out again with the local all right let's go over there so see what's going on already hunley all let's right. go Sounds good. come on <laughs> 